so I'll start. So yeah, I'm going to sort of close off this session. Um, in comparison to Santosh and Roberto, my talk is going to be a bit more high level. I'm not quite as uh, further through it to them. Originally, it was going to be an individual talk, and then it got merged into synthetic data talk. So spoiler alert, I will be talking about this cloning at some point during this talk. Um, but I'm hoping to give a bit of an overview as well into why we're interested in this and, and what I've been up to, essentially. So, so essentially, starting at the start, why, why are we interested in exploring voice recognition? So in comparison, I mean, I don't like to compare my deities usually because each of them have their own unique purpose and have a, a reason for the, their existing. But uh, voice recognition is a non-invasive modality that does not require physical contact or specialized hardware. It can be easily captured non-intrusively, making it accessible for a wide range of individuals. And if we are to compare it to other modalities, fingerprints can cause difficulties with individuals, particularly those with physical disabilities, uh, the elderly and certain manual labor jobs. Face can be affected by lighting conditions, facial expressions, the presence of accessories like hats or glasses, and iris generally requires specialists of specialist hardware. And we have an issue regarding willingness from the participants to actually have things post close to their eye. So voice recognition can pose a solution to all of these issues, uh, so all of these problems, um, and also combined additional security when combined with other modalities. But in the interest of our project, what we're really interested in is looking at voice from the perspective of developing nations. So if we put it in that regard, um, there are really three key issues that we've identified here. And they kind of go along with these articles that I've displayed on the PowerPoint slide here. So the first one, uh, the ICO complaining about the use of facial recognition in public spaces. Uh, this was regarding the lace of um, personalised adverts that were going to measure you as you uh, approach them and start taking key characteristics like how your engagement, your age, sex, ethnicity, in order to create targeted advertisements depending on where you move to. So as you can imagine, there was a big privacy concern when this came out. Uh, secondly, for our case, is the actual use of technology. So unsurprisingly, in developing nations, uh, smartphone use is not equally distributed around the world. But for developing developed nations, the average smartphone, average person with 76% of people own a smartphone compared to about 45% in developing nations. And that drops to 24% in India and 71% in Kenya. It is also worth pointing out that actually about 6% of British households don't have access to the internet for various reasons, including not being able to afford broadband, access to the technology, or just poor digital skills. And that comes from an off report in 2022. Uh, and then the last thing here, we've got laws and guidance. So this actually was an article from the Australia Commission about their use of digital identity when they were planning on releasing their facial recognition plans. And obviously the cause of concern around, as Santos mentioned previously, bias and discrimination. However, it's also noticed as Carson mentioned at the beginning, we went to ID for Africa last week. And in the workshop, one of the last days, one of the key points that kept coming across in the talk about distribution wasn't that they were unable to do it. It was the lack of um, law, data protection laws actually being excessively ready to roll out. So they were waiting for the laws to come in so they could roll out the technology Whereas you could argue here, we're in the other situation where the laws are coming out because of issues of privacy and ethical concerns that we're presented with. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I think a lot of us are aware of the current mainstream use cases for voice, uh, assist, uh, voice recognition, mostly on virtual assistance. But I did want to just highlight the, the banking one, as it will come up quite in a second when we will introduce the, the voice cloning concept. But here is an article from HSBC about 50% uh, of their uh, they've been able to block around 50% of their fraudulent transactions just from the introduction of telephone banking into their systems. And I tend to always show this kind of slide when I do a presentation. This is actually the official uh, ISO um, diagram for what a biometric system is. I put voice in brackets here because it applies to all of them. But as you can see there, it's divided into different subsections and Obviously, when it comes to voice, uh, what we like to do is obviously extract features from the audio recording. In this case, the, the one that we usually use is called male frequency such broad coefficients. And that takes into consideration things like the pitch, tone, cadence, and the person's rhythm. 
But the other reason I wanted to show this recently is because it came out, I think, last month. There was a report from iProve, a big biometric company, uh, and they were assessing the landscape of threats for biometrics in the current scheme of things. And they were saying that the most common threat now for a biometric system is digital injection attacks, which is five times more likely than presentation attacks. So we've kind of moved from the, the data capture subsystem to the signal processing system where we should be potentially considering uh, preventative measures for synthetic data going forward. Uh, again, when it comes to voice, again, sort of three main attack vectors at the moment, the three main ones, impersonation, so mimicry, obviously it's just an intruder trying to impersonate someone speaking, the replay attack, it's obviously using pre-recorded on like a phone or something and then sending it back through so you're replaying a pre-recorded voice. Uh, we're generally, in terms of the literature, quite good at capturing these sort of attacks now. Usually there's um, machine learning approaches that will uh, attack, um, seek out the artifacts in the recording, particularly something called the pop noise. That's um, common in microphone recordings. So we can detect that and be able to, um, to tell it's a replay attack. But then last but not least, the one that we're probably most interested in is the speech synthesis or text to speech. So this is generating uh, natural sounding artificial speech for arbitrary text. And this is where the voice cloning comes into play. So again, this is just some articles that I pulled out over the last couple of months, and it seems to be increasing. To be honest, every, every month there seems to be a new article to do with voice player spoofing at the moment. Um, and I think there's a lot of the cases to do with how the generation of this synthetic data has changed from before we needed arguably a lot more data a lot of minutes worth of speech to be able to generate this this um these proofs to, to mere seconds and microsoft released their report sorry their uh research paper in january about valley which can supposedly spoof a voice with just three seconds of audio um a lot of these attacks work on the same way as as you'd expect for scans and fraud, they make you think you're under pressure and you need to uh, act straight away. So the AI scan from the telephone has been increasing quite a lot. There was one um, spoof uh, grandson's voice was saying he's in jail, needed money for bail. And another one about uh, someone was rang up saying they killed a US diplomat and you need money for legal fees. Um, Typical HMRC type scams are now representing someone that you potentially know or care for. And then the alternative, going back to the banking stuff, now we can use these potentially to break into our own bank accounts. The original one was a voice article, I believe, and we managed to clone their voice using Eleven Labs, which I will come on to in a little bit. And they managed to break into their bank account with Lloyd's. So this might be a good time to switch if you are banking with Lloyds. But since that's come out, there's been a several other who basically replicated this and now can either fool uh, their bank simply by generating these, these voices. And this is an article I saw last week. I was about to move on to just doing some fun with voice cloning for this. But um, apparently, um, was it last week when Apple released their beta for iOS 17, it's going to include a feature where you can actually clone your voice and Siri will respond as you. So everything I've been doing up to this point has been sort of open source or commercially available on the website. Come the autumn, it's possible that everyone has voice cloning technology in a pocket in their phone. So keep an eye on that. Apple's worldwide development conference is this evening, so they might mention it. But anyway, I just thought that was a fun little add in here. But what I really wanted to just go into now is just a sort of snapshot of some of the things that I've been looking at in terms of voice cloning. So as I mentioned, Eleven Labs is the one that in all these reports that you hear about, this is the one that keeps coming up over and over again. Obviously it's commercial software, so it's hard to actually say how it works. They're obviously marketing blurb will tell you it's uh, advanced machine learning algorithms and it's capable of creating a unique characteristics. But the other ones available, the ones I've been exploring, the open source ones, uh, which I put some links to here as well. You've got the real-time voice cloning, which has now spun out into another company called Resemble.ai. Uh, Copley is one that I had was working quite well for me, and then I ended up running into some issues where the data started playing up. And then uh, Tortoise TTS, so named because it's slow, 
uh, generating voices and the sister of it, Tortoise TTS Fast, which implemented into some improvement to speed up how the voice cloning works. I did actually, uh, yes, I started on Broadway. I did Hairspray. I played Little Inez on Broadway for three years. So that was my start actually before the movies, yes. I'm not going to lie, but when I got the part, you know, despite all the naysayers in that, you just have to go in and say, you know what, I'm an actress and I want to bring it. And I just. We haven't learned our lessons to forgive each other and to show unconditional love. And until we do, this movie won't, or this story. At the Alan Turing Institute, my voice is my password. I did actually. Uh, yes, I started on Broadway. I did Hairspray. I played Little. Sorry. <laughs> Good. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> so. What I then did is I wanted to test how the verification were compared on these different um, samples. So for this, we use the, I use an open source framework called SpeechBrain, which is used to do essentially all speech tasks, including speech, speech recognition, speaker recognition, speech separation, and so forth. Uh, this is actually pre-trained on the Voxelab data set, or the models I'm using were pre-trained on the Voxelab data set. So they've technically already been exposed to these um, speech sounds. And they have two models available to use. Uh, one is called uh, what's called X vector, which uses the X vector architect. Some people in AI might understand a bit more about the technical stuff than I do here, but it's a deep neural network that is used for this task using time delay neural networks. My understanding was before there was a D vector, which would take sort of snippet by snippet, and then the X vector was the next stage long where it took a sliding window of samples from the audio, took the mean and average of standard deviation, and used that to generate the. Um, embeddings and then this last one which is going to be the sort of current state of the art the ECAPA, uh, which again uses the time delay neural network but this one has a multi-head attention mechanism which my rough understanding and someone please correct me if i'm wrong uses the buzzword transformers in terms of a delayed neural network and then, so it actually learns better from the embeddings going through the neural network rather than the right at the end. So these are the two models that I use to compare. I'm doing the time. I used to compare um, against these these recordings that I previously took. So we have a quick look at them. The X Vector one was absolutely rubbish. Um, in fact, I think it's broken. And I actually contacted the speech frame people because it doesn't seem to work for me whatsoever no matter what i compare against i'm getting scores of 0.99 which is these are similarity scores between zero and one so it's basically saying everything's perfect and everything matches everything else and then the thing on the right the true is the uh, decision value so obviously you've got the match score and then for a biometric system you've got the decision threshold as well so in all these cases it's saying yeah this is perfect these all match everyone's the same in fact, the um, voice clone is scoring slightly higher than everything else. So it seems totally broken to me. Uh, but on the plus side, the e kappa one, working a bit better as I would expect. So we've got the genuine compassion at the top there for the score of 0.65, this is true. And then we've got our imposter comparison. Again, as you'd expect, it, it drops quite significantly and it's no longer part of the threshold. And then we've got our comparison against the spoof which is sitting around 0.2. But as you can see, the decision, the decision pressure of this is actually really small. It's about 0.05. Anything above that is considered to be a match because it's supposedly that specific. Um, you might be saying, oh, that's okay. We can just change the decision threshold. And arguably you'd be right. If we were to draw a distribution of our scores and our match rates, and we can change where the decision pressure arose, we could fix it so it would no longer accept spoof attacks, but I should obviously point out this is just a, a trial run here and it's quite dumbed down and 
I've been seeing slightly different scores between two and 0.4 as well. Although I don't think changing the threshold is going to fix this problem. What we really want to be do is actually detecting these spooks, which is again a rather dumbed down um, attempt that we've started to do here. So this one is actually um, comes from uh, another open source repository resembler, and this allows you to train uh, networks so that you can actually so it's specific to the speaker. You give it some of its genuine samples, it's specific, in theory, learns to detect between real and fake voices. In this case, it's taken the very it's taken two recordings, genuine recordings from ID 10683, and it's then tried to determine what's fake and what's real. In this case, it hasn't really been able to tell the difference, as you can see. In fact, the uh, fake is actually scoring slightly higher in terms of similarity to ground truth than the next genuine is. Uh, but again, the more you will feed into actually training the classifier to determine between fake and real, those will um, shift accordingly. So this was just a starting attempt to actually then move on to the next step, just looking into the detection methods. And that's mostly what I wanted to say. This moving on, essentially the next step really is to go more into depth into what Roberto and what Santosh is doing in terms of looking at the latent space and actually the strategic embeddings to make a more um, beneficial classifier that will be able to detect these spook attacks as we move forward. So arguably the thing I put in the small text there is actually probably the biggest next step, which is finding possible ways to <laughs> detect the basic data based on these features, but also just exploring the um, embeddings in general. Uh, yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say.